Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Megan. I'm an alcoholic. Um, all right, 10 minutes. Let's see. <laughs> Experience, strength, and hope. What happened, what it was like, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, so um, the kind of drinker I was um, and is a blackout drinker that doesn't, it just really doesn't remember a lot of what happened. And um, the bottom that I had was one where I had to lose pretty much all the things. Um, that was the kind of bottom I had to have in order for me to um, be willing to sit down in the chair of rehab and the rooms and be quiet and listen to what everyone in here had to say to me and try to my best of my ability to do what you guys told me to do so that I could stay sober. Um, and so um, I have um, a little over five years of sobriety now. Um, so I, um, I come from parents where uh, my father was a raging alcoholic who was really, really mean to me <laughs> and um, a codependent, like super black belt codependent mother. And my parents were divorced. And so when I lived with my dad, um, it was, you know, troubled times and it was really pretty awful. And so I swore I was never going to be like my dad. Um, there is alcoholism and drug addiction on both sides of my family, my, both sides of my family down the chain. So like genetically speaking, I probably didn't have a prayer, but, um, I, you know, so I ended up with it. And, and so what I swore to not be like my dad. And so I was a late bloomer. I didn't start drinking until I was about 25. But when I did start, I was, you know, out of the gate straight away. Um, the way that I drank was, um, it's primarily vodka out of plastic and um, rarely out of any sort of glass with ice or anything like that. Um, and I hit it and I hit it everywhere. And that was kind of my MO was to like literally drink in my closet and hide it as much as possible. And my consequences at first were kind of dumb and silly. And I thought I could get away with them. And, um, and I would do things that were embarrassing to myself and I would fall downstairs and get a lot of bruises and things like that, which were pretty bad, but they weren't enough to like really go bad for me in my life is for what I thought it wasn't, wasn't all that bad. Um, but very quickly, I mean, I drank alcoholically for 11 and a half years before I stopped. And very quickly during that 11 and a half years, um, I lost my marriage. I lost my career. I, you know, was drunk on the job. I was drunk all the time. I pulled, you know, um, geographic and, um, I left my ex-husband in order to drink more. And that's what I did. And, and, and eventually this is 10 minutes. So I can quickly just say that eventually I was a 24 seven drinker. I was a get up in the morning, drunk right away, immediately out of the gate, never sober person. Um, and at the end of 2013, um, I had, had already involved myself with a man who beat me up. I, you know, who, you know, drank and used worse than I did. And, um, I could no longer, I was not eating <laughs> and I was, I could no longer keep any alcohol down. So I, I couldn't live without it, but I couldn't keep it down. And so I had, um, the DTs, um, at the end of 2013, um, really horrible, like psychotic break DTs. <laughs> I was in a coma for seven days and that wasn't my bottom. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I came in, um, but that last year was me finally trying to quit for the last year of my drinking and not being able to, I could not stop. And that's the important part about being an alcoholic that I, I like to say is that what makes me an alcoholic is that I, um, it's not about what my parents did to me or anything like that. It's, it's about, um, as soon as I put alcohol into my body, I cannot stop no matter what I do. If I take one drink of alcohol, I'm screwed. I cannot stop. And so, um, it took me a lot of time. It took me three chemical detoxes. It took me, you know, three times in Cherry Hill. It took me losing my home. It took me getting kicked out of options in Berkeley 
Um, it took me, you know, just, and, and being physically ill all the time, sick, constantly sick out both ends, sick all the time. And, um, so at the end of, um, or no, August 25th, 2014 is my sobriety date. And that last weekend of my drinking was me getting kicked out of options from Berkeley, which, which was the last stop for me. I didn't have a home anymore when they kicked me out of there. They dropped me off, um, in front of Highland hospital at three o'clock in the morning drunk off my ass with a pair of flip-flops and and um <laughs> and um with n- no other there was nothing left in me that could justify my drinking there was nothing left in here that could possibly all of the time that I had been drinking and and I was trying to obliterate Megan it was unacceptable for me to be me. It was unacceptable for me to feel feelings. It was disgusting for me to be me. I hated myself. I hated myself. But there I was at this position where I thought, I don't want to live like this anymore, and I don't want to die. And that's where I was finally at this place where I could say that to myself and think it and believe it. And um, and I just was. I just. I just was done. You know, and I, I knew that that was it. Like I was going to be a, a dead, you know, I just, I, I knew I wasn't going to be, I was going to be homeless and I was going to be dead pretty quick after, you know? And, um, so I finally went back to rehab, but this time I went back into rehab and I was, I was licked. Like it says in the book, I was beat. I had King alcohol had kicked the shit out of me. My ass was whooped and I had no, you know, I just had no more left in there. And I, I finally, I went in there, my hands and knees. And he's like, I don't care what you tell me to do. I will do anything you tell me to do to stay sober. I, whatever you say, I will do it. Keep me sober. Please tell me how to stay sober. And, um, that's, so that's what I did. So I was, you know, I was in super agony at that time. And so I was super teachable because I was like, you know, I was, I, you know, and so I, I hit the steps hard, you know, right away. As soon as I was in rehab, I got a sponsor over the phone because I was in rehab and I talked to her on the phone and she read the book with me over the phone, you know, and, um, but, uh, I, I had to get to a place where I could ask for help and then I could accept the help that I needed. I had to get to a place where I knew I needed help. Instead of me thinking that I was fine and I could manage this no matter what, I can, I can, st- I had this idea in my head that I could be drunk all the time and I'd be fine. That was just going to be fine. And, um, and I really thought that, you know, and, um, and when I got into rehab, um, they taught me a couple of things, but, but first of all, how to get sober, how to stay sober were two, two different things. And, um, but what I do is still the same thing that I did to get sober. What I do to stay sober is still the same thing. And what, what they told me to do in rehab was go to meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps and be of service and sit down and be quiet, get a sponsor, work the steps, go to meetings, get a service commitment and keep doing. They just would wave these four fingers around at us, you know, in rehab, do the four things, just keep, and then just keep doing them. You know, don't drink. You'll be fine. (laughs) It was kind of like, you know, the idea. And it's so simple. It's not um, a complicated program. And um, what I have gotten out of AA is so much more than what I thought I was going to get. I am sober right now, and I am able one day at a time. I got to think of it one day at a time. I'm able to stay sober. And um, I learned how to rely on a higher power, which is absolutely 100% crucial to me to depend on my higher power, ask for help, admit every day that I'm not in charge, admit every day that it's not up to me, that I do not get to rule the universe. And, um, and that I have this connection with my higher power that's going to, um, through this program and through working the steps of this program, keep me sober. Um, and, uh, and one of the things the program teaches me how to do by, by utilizing the spiritual principles is to um, not be addicted to people. And not being addicted to people actually is part of what keeps me sober. Do you know what I mean? Like I learn how to not be a jerk. And so that's actually, believe it or not, one of the things that helps me feel better about myself, which is one of the things that keeps me sober. Um, I have talked enough. I'm going to pass um, this over to my wonderful husband and see what he has to say. Thank you.
I'm Keith. I'm an alcoholic. I'm sober, and that's kind of like a little miracle. Actually, it's a pretty big one, because sort of my default state is to be intoxicated as soon as I'm awake, and to try to stay that way until I lose consciousness. And I'm not that way today, and I haven't been for several years, and that that's kind of an amazing thing, because that was the story for pretty much as long as I have been like aware of self. Um, I've got like 40 minutes to talk, which is an awful long time. So I found when I was really new that one of the first, one of the things I really helped me feel a part of here and helped me feel accepted and helped me feel like these sort of my people was when people shared about like what things used to be like for them. There was a lot of shit in there that I heard people say that I was like, holy fuck, I can't believe you're telling people you did that. I did that too, and I was never going to tell anyone. And like when they said it, everybody was like, ha, 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 yay. I'm like, the fuck? Right? Like that's some bizarre shit. Like this is, these are horrible things of which I'm just tremendously embarrassed and thought I was never going to tell like anyone ever. And everybody in here is like, yeah, I did that too. And you know, when I heard that, I was like, oh, I sort of belong here. Like, this is a place where people are a lot like me. And they seem to be dealing with things, like, way better than I have. Like, I'm going to stick around and sort of see what's up. Maybe figure some stuff out. I don't know that I've really figured anything out, but, you know, it's still working. So, like, I come from a big family. I'm the youngest of six kids. And I was born in Rochester, New York, which is a long fucking way away from here and kind of a shithole. And I haven't been there since I was like eight. We had a sort of a big house and a big family and a lot of drama and a lot of crazy shit. Um, a lot of the things I can remember from that period of my life were very, very traumatic. I don't remember a lot of like positive stuff. I remember being seriously physically injured multiple times. I remember when I was three, my brother Alan attacked my mother with a knife so that he could get money to buy his heroin. And my dad happened to have come home while that was happening. And he beat the fuck out of Alan and threw him out of the house. And I've actually never seen that brother again. I, I was three years old. And this was my first, like, cautionary tale of don't do drugs. Drugs are bad, okay? You know? Um, <laughs> I, I also remember getting chased off a sun deck by a duck. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. <laughs> my brother had a pet duck. It was bigger than me. I was, like, two and a half years old. I had a peanut butter sandwich. That duck wanted my sandwich. He chased my ass. I ran, like, right off the end of a sun deck. I fell about 30 feet and landed on my head. I was two and a half years old. I, I have a vivid picture in my head of the duck. I have a vivid picture in my head of my grandma swaddling me after the incident and putting me in a sky-blue Pontiac Grand Am. And then not much else, right? I, I learned, of course, much later that I had an eight-inch fracture in my skull, which had ramifications for me much later in life that weren't exactly awesome. I also remember like falling off of um, like a jungle gym submarine and breaking my left collarbone on my way down. You know, <laughs> I remember a sledding accident where I hit a canoe on a sled and like the lip of the canoe grabbed my lip and pulled it off and you could lift up my lip and stick my tongue out through the hole under it. Those are like my childhood memories from living in Rochester. There are several others. I, they get more graphic, actually. I won't get into them. Like, childhood was kind of bloody. And this, this doesn't actually include all of, like, the physical fighting between me and my brothers, because there was an awful lot of it. And I, I learned very young that when they attacked me, and they did, and they were all a lot fucking bigger than me, I had to get something really big, really heavy, and fucking whack them with it. This is how I learned to defend myself when I was a kid. Uh, I do not have a brother that has not had to have stitches because of me directly. I didn't kill any of them, but I messed them up pretty good. 
Um, that took, I took that with me to school, too, and got into a lot of fights at school. I put a lot of kids in the hospital, like, before I was about 10, which I think isn't really super typical. Um, yeah. You know, we, when I was eight, we uprooted. We moved to, like, rural West Virginia, and we went from this big three-story house on the beach in, in Rochester, New York, to, like, a double wide in the woods in the middle of fucking nowhere, West Virginia. That was really weird. And, like, at the same time, my dad, like, disappeared out of the country, and we weren't allowed to talk to him. I, I don't have any, like, actual explanation of this. Just reporting to you guys, like, what I saw happening. And when he finally came back into the country, he was like, I don't know what this shit is, but we're out of here. And we moved to Arizona. And I grew up in a little... I say grew up, but I mean I lived in all those places and grew up there too. But I, I, we moved to Arizona to a little town. Some of you probably have heard of it. It's called Lake Havasu City. And Lake Havasu is famous for a couple of things. One of which is that there are absolutely massive parties that go on there a couple times a year. I feel like when I mention this to people here, they're always like, spring break, yay! That was not the big party, actually, in Lake Havasu. The big one was on Labor Day and Memorial Day weekends. All of these people from L.A. with these multi-hundred thousand dollar boats and a bunch of strippers and a huge supply of drugs would come into Lake Havasu, put their boats in the water, drive across the lake, park their boats there, tie them all together, and have a massive orgy for like three days straight. And that was kind of the thing around which I grew up. And they did this. Side note, like, because across the lake was a reservation that was actually in California, not in Arizona. And the Arizona police and sheriff had absolutely no jurisdiction in that reservation on the California side of the river. So people could go over there and do whatever, and the cops could do nothing to them. So they just sit over there for, like, three days and do absolute craziness. It was a lot of nakedness, a lot of sex, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol. Those were sort of norm where I was from, you know? Um, I was sort of staunchly religious at the time. My parents had raised me as a solid Catholic, and they'd taken me to church every Sunday and made me dress up and made me go to Sunday school and all that shit. And up until about the age of 14, I was, like, avidly religious, and I started to question that around that age. And I also started drinking. My first time I ever got drunk, my friends and I broke into a house that we knew to be vacant. We found that they had a wet bar in that house. We stole a bottle of black velvet Canadian whiskey, which we stashed in a bush after we got out of that house. And we made a plan that that Friday we were all going to stay at my buddy Mike's house. And when we were at Mike's house, like his parents themselves were serious alcoholics and they'd pass out around like eight, like on the couch. So we, we made a plan that when they passed out, we were going to go out, we were going to retrieve that bottle, and we were going to drink it. And I feel like I drank most of it. I, I don't know how realistic that is, but like we sat in a circle on the golf course, and we passed that bottle around until it was empty. And all of us were vomiting. We all passed out, like blackout passed out. We woke up in the morning, and there were, like, poodles, pools of vomit all over Mike's room, and we had, like, destroyed the fucking place. <laughs> and oddly enough, his parents didn't say anything about it. They just like, eh. Like, but, like, my very first experience with alcohol, I was blackout drunk. You know? And I f felt really at home. Like, I felt, in the morning, I felt like, oh, God, I'll never do that again. And then the next day I was planning to do the same thing again the next weekend, you know? Like, as soon as I could get my hands on another bottle of booze, we're going to do this shit again. And that became our normal, like, weekend activity when I was, like, 14. We tried to get booze from wherever we could, and we got around and we drank it. Um, drugs that were around in Lake Havasu were sort of hard to come by. When the people from L.A. would come in, they'd bring all kinds of coke and stuff with them, but I'll tell you what there was a plentiful supply of in Lake Havasu was methamphetamine. And when I was like 16, my buddy showed me that if you used a bunch of methamphetamine, you could stay up all night, drink more, 
and not get sick. I was fucking in. Well, that, that sounded like something I really wanted for myself. You know? And so, like, I started doing a lot of math. Within about six months, I was, like, stealing any outdoor light bulbs I could find on people's houses and smoking my meth out of their light bulbs and doing all kinds of horrible shit. We started breaking into cars and stealing people's stereos and breaking into their houses and trying to find money in their drawers and doing all kinds of horrible things so that we could get more stuff and so that we could stay high for longer periods of time. It was not really a pretty scene. I fell in with some people that I didn't really want to know, and I didn't like them, but I stayed with them because they had all the drugs. And I observed some shit that I don't really ever want to see again, and I didn't like it very much. I had kind of an aha morning one day. I wasn't waking up. I was just up, and I was at a place that you might qualify as a crack house, and sort of like coming to my senses and looking around me and there were people like in the corners with toothbrushes scrubbing shit and there was like this really ugly short guy with like a bodyguard in the corner getting a blowjob and it was really fucking weird and I had one of those moments where everything like turned sideways and I was like the fuck am I doing here this is messed up like I'm out and I decided that day, like, I'm not going to use meth anymore, right? Meth is a horrible drug. I'm going to get sober, which to me meant I'm going to drink all day <laughs> and maybe smoke some pot if I can get my hands on it. A couple months later, I discovered cocaine. And I was living in Vegas, and a friend of mine who was in a band on New Year's Eve came over to my apartment with his other buddy, and he showed me and my friends how to free this. And I was like, where has this been all my life? I really need this. <laughs> and I was sort of off to the races with that. Um, I did everything I could to keep getting as high as I could for as long as I could. It was kind of awful looking back at it, but there was also a lot of like poignant good times in there and a lot of betrayal and a lot of distrust and a lot of theft and a lot of shit. I had moved from Las Vegas to Colorado. I did a lot of moving. Like I, I didn't like being in any one place for very long. And whenever a friend like went somewhere new and told me, I moved to this cool new place, you should check it out. I was like, dude, I'm moving in with you. <laughs> I'd like go to that place and like be, I'm sleeping on your couch. You know, um, so I moved to Colorado and I had a thing happen where I showed all those guys how to freebase because that was a thing I was really into and I thought it was really wonderful. And if only they knew the joys of freebase, we could all have the greatest of times together. <laughs> um, we got a lot of coke one night, a lot, lot. And, you know, we did a bunch of it together and then everybody else like went to bed. And I sat up and did the rest of it, like by myself on the couch, a piece of aluminum foil and a straw and a lighter. And it wasn't really pretty. When my friends came out of their rooms in the morning, I was still sitting there doing exactly that, except there wasn't really any coke left, but I was still like igniting things and sucking on them. <laughs> <laughs> we discovered that there were like bubbles like on my skin here. And, like, I pushed one down, and it, like, moved over. And I was like, well, that, that's sort of not normal. So I, I showed it to one of my roommates at the time, and she literally ran out of the room screaming. And I thought to myself, maybe there's something a little bit more wrong than what I thought. Like, something's not good. <laughs> I showed it to one of my other roommates, Mike, and he... He's like, oh, fuck, dude, I think we probably need to go to the hospital. But before doing that, I called my parents and told them, there's bubbles under my skin. I've been freebasing cocaine all night. What do you think I should do? <laughs> <laughs> Calm, rational thinking, right? I, uh, 
they told me you should go to the fucking hospital, you idiot. So I did that. The doctors took an x-ray and they said my chest cavity was starting to fill up with air and that my heart was going to stop. And I asked them, well, that, how could that happen? And they said, you burnt a hole in your trachea. What have you been doing? And I was like, I haven't smoked a bunch of cocaine. They were like, you probably shouldn't do that. And then they wanted to put like a hole between my ribs to like let all the air out so my heart wouldn't stop, you know? Um, this was sort of one of those in incidents where I think any like normal sane person would have been like, no, nope, no more drugs. Like, I'm just, I'm fucking done. But like me, I wasn't done. I was done with cocaine. Just like, just like I had been done with methamphetamine. No more cocaine. You know, like everything else, as long as it's not coke, as long as it's not meth, I'm good. Like that shit isn't going to take me down the way that these things did, right? Um... <laughs> I was pretty dumb. <laughs> I, I was a person who really didn't like themselves and really didn't like enjoy the world and didn't know how to function at all. These were the things I was using to cope with the world around me and to like feel okay. And I was slowly like one at a time taking away those coping mechanisms, right? Um, I still allowed myself to drink. I allowed myself to smoke pot. I allowed myself to take pills. I just couldn't do meth and coke anymore, right? Um, I told my parents, I'm quitting drugs. And my parents were like, if you do that, we'll send you to college. I was like, cool, there's more drugs there than anywhere. Send me. They're, they were like, okay, you're going to college. So I moved in with them back in Lake Havasu and went to community college for like a semester and then transferred to the University of Arizona. And... I attended the University of Arizona for several years. <laughs> I wasn't com completely fruitless, though. I, I actually have a master's degree in physics with a, a major in astrophysics. Um, I'm not dumb. <laughs> I'm just a fucking junkie. <laughs> I do a lot of stupid shit, but totally not dumb, right? Um, like I'm Phi Beta Kappa, like all the things. I'm a smart guy even when I'm high as fuck. Because I was always high as fuck. Um, <laughs> I got married at college. I have a son. Um, we moved to Chicago. Don't move to Chicago. <laughs> it sucks. It, it fucking blows. It's cold as fuck in the winter. It's hotter than balls in the summer. There, there's like the two-week period of the year where it's like nice to be outdoors. And the rest of the time, you're like hiding from the weather. It's just not fun. Um, I started drinking really heavily, really, really heavily when we moved to Chicago. I had like a nine-to-five kind of job. I had two kids. I had a wife that I hated. And I had a fucking bottle of whiskey every night. You know, I, I had just moved there, so I didn't know anybody with weed. I didn't know anybody with pills, but I sure as fuck knew I could get my bottle of whiskey every night. And I, I drank myself pretty hard. I, I developed something that's called gout. For those of you that don't know, that's a buildup of uric acid crystals in your joints. It hurts like a motherfucker. It's like someone stabbing you in your goddamn feet. It's really horrid. Um, we then moved to Berkeley. Well, we moved to Albany. My, my ex-wife got a job at UC Berkeley, and we moved to Albany, and I got here, and the doctors were like, you have a lot of pain. You have gout. Here's a prescription for pot, right? Which This is when it was just medically legal. And so I, I started, you know, drinking my bottle of whiskey every day and smoking an eighth of weed every day and popping a bunch of Vicodin every day, and it wasn't really pretty. I didn't leave my house a lot. I couldn't get away from my house for periods of longer than 45 minutes before I felt an overwhelming anxiety about having to go get high again. I really, I had a horrible compulsion to use at every moment of every fucking day. I'd take my kids to the park, and by the time we got there, I was like, get back in the fucking car, we're going home. Uh, I was horribly abusive. I did a lot of things that I really don't feel good about doing. 
I didn't have a social life of any kind. I couldn't manage one. I didn't have a job of any kind. I couldn't manage one. I had this relationship with this horribly abusive person to whom I was also horribly abusive. And I had this little tiny world where I would stay and do my shit every day. She, with the help of a psychologist whom I'd been seeing for some time at the time, convinced me that I needed to go to rehab. And the way I saw it at the time was like, if I go to rehab, my wife is just going to shut the fuck up. She's going to leave me the hell alone. My tolerance is going to go way the hell back down. And like when I get out of rehab, I'll be able to get high cheap and she'll stop bitching at me. It was literally like my plan. I thought it was brilliant, right? <laughs> Clever jump, right? I, I went to this rehab program. I stayed there for like 30 days. I, I didn't really get sober while I was there. Um, when I got out, she was still bitching at me. It was really not pleasant. I got a lot worse. I was most of the time covered in vomit and urine and a lot of bong water. I, I didn't have much going on in my world, and I was really a pitiful, depressing, horribly sad person. I was the kind of person where when the phone would ring, I would have horrible fear of whatever person might be calling, and I would turn the phone off and put it in a drawer and like hide from it. I didn't want contact with other people. I was afraid of everything, and I never dealt with any of the problems that were happening in my world. I got a weird phone call one day from the place I had gone to rehab asking me if I wanted to come back. It was really weird to me, and I had no idea how they might know that I might want to come back, but I really did. I had heard this weird message while I was there that people were sober and that they didn't do the shit that I did. And I didn't understand how that was possible and wasn't able to get there myself. When they called me and they said this thing to me, I, I literally broke down crying and I fell over on the ground and was just unable to talk to them for a little bit. It was that goddamn depressing. And when I could pick up the phone again, I said to them, yes, I want to come back. Please take me now. I went back there, and I had a very, very different plan. My plan when I went back there was to try to learn everything I could from these people and to try to actually help myself to be a different person. And if that meant being sober, that was what I was going to goddamn do. I went there, and I spent 30 days there. And I learned a lot of things and met a lot of interesting, wonderful people and a lot of shitheads. <laughs> <laughs> While I was there, my now ex-wife served me divorce papers. She had a new lease drafted by our management people so that I wasn't on it. She changed the locks on the doors. Wouldn't let me back into my home when I got out. I had to find a new place to go. Kind of everything I owned fit very nicely in this big black trash bag. <laughs> and I walked from this place called the Newbridge Foundation up near the Greek Theater, to the Greek Theater in Cal, down to like it's not the People's Park; it's the one across from Berkeley High. Okay. Yeah, and I, there's a there's a rehab there called Options, and I, I went there and I, I sat in this chair for like all day. While watching people go in and out, saying to them, look, I need help, I need housing, I need to stay sober, please help me. They put me in what's called a transitional housing situation. I had no idea what the fuck that meant at the time. Um, but I knew I really didn't want to be under the bridge. And I had no other alternatives. At least I didn't see any. So uh, I stayed there. They put me in this house with these other people whom I felt like I got not a single thing in common with these people. They're really weird. I really don't like them. I'm scared. I don't like it here. I feel like bad things are going to happen to me. Um, turned out that those were wonderful people that they put me in a house with. Even though they were sort of scary to me at first, they were really different than what I was used to. All of them had a real, bunch of really important stuff that they could teach me. And they were all willing to help me in ways I didn't really imagine. You know, I, there were people whom I looked at, and I was like, I don't want to know you. And it turned out, like, getting to know them was one of the best things that could have happened to me. They had a lot of cool shit that they taught me about. 
One of the things they taught me was that I should go to meetings. Not only was it a really nice way to get the fuck out of that house, but every time I felt like I had a compulsion to drink, I would go to one of these meetings, and I would sit. Sometimes I'd talk, but by the end of the meeting, I didn't really have a compulsion to drink anymore. It, it was weird, and there was a definite correlation. So every time I had one of those compulsions, I went to a meeting. In like my first 90 days of sobriety, I was going to three or four meetings every single day. I mean, when you have no job, you have nothing to do, and you live in a place that's scary to you, <laughs> there aren't too many places that are going to take you in. This was a place with like free coffee and cookies, and people were nice to me. I raised my hand, and I said horrible things, and they were all like, <laughs> like, like okay, <laughs> I don't quite understand, but I'm here. Please help, you know? Um, I, I was still very scared of things. I uh, kept coming to meetings a lot and didn't really get to know anybody because I'd sort of run away from them as soon as the meeting was over. I'd come in, I'd sit in the corner, and I'd kind of pretend to be invisible, you know? And then during the meeting, when it was time for sharing, I would put up my hand and I would say, woe is me, I'm Keith, and all these horrible things have happened to me, and you should feel really sorry for me, my life sucks. I would do what I called emotionally vomiting on those meetings, and then I would run away. I started regularly attending the 6.15 a.m. one at Rockridge because as soon as I was awake at that fucking house, I wanted to get the hell out of it. And the people there started to, like, recognize me. I didn't really recognize them yet because fuzzy-headed as hell still, right? But they knew who I was, and they knew my story, and they'd been paying attention. And one day after a meeting, one of them was like, you really need a sponsor? And I, I had been thinking about this for a while, and I had in my mind this vision of what my sponsor would be like. You know, they, they'd be Italian-American. <laughs> they'd be about 45 or 50 years old. They'd be divorced and have kids. And they would have been like an ex-crackhead, right? And this guy who approached me was like this tall, bald, old guy with glasses, whom I had absolutely nothing in common with, like nothing. But he was like, you need a sponsor. And then he was like, I'm going to introduce you to this guy, because he didn't want to sponsor me. I was a whole can of fucked up, and he, he knew it. And he, he like tried to introduce me to Fitz, actually, John Fitzsimmons. And uh, Fitz was like, no, you sponsor <laughs> And I was like, fuck. This is what it's come to, right? Um, so that guy was my sponsor. I didn't realize at the time that he had like three months more sober than I did. I, di I didn't ask any questions. I was just like, okay, this is the thing I'm supposed to do, so I'm going to like do it, right? And so I, I went with that guy, and we worked the steps. And I don't know what, what I thought about the steps, I never had an aha, like, oh, my God, the blinding white light of joy, and now I believe in God, and let's all dance hallelujah. That, 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 like, never fucking happened for me. What did happen was, like, one day, that guy, his name was Gus, he was like, he asked me, like, does your life feel different today than it did before? And I was like, yeah, like, th things are different. And he's like, because I've been watching what's going on for you. And, like, I'm seeing that, like, not only are you not fucking up everything around you anymore, but you seem to be, like, employed now. You seem to be able to talk to people. And you weren't doing that when we first met. You seem to be able to hang out and, like, speak in a way that's not woe is me anymore. And you just seem, like, generally kind of happy. And I looked at him and I said, well, that that all seems to be kind of, like, true. <laughs> and it, it was... Then I became aware that there had been a serious change, not only in, like, who I am, but in, like, my approach to the world. Like, I was really a different person. It had been about a year and a half that I'd been coming to the rooms and was sober that whole time when I looked at things and was like, fucking, who the hell am I? I really didn't know. What I knew was I wasn't the person I had been a year and a half ago. 
And I didn't know who I was or what I wanted to do or, like, what I was all about. I, I had been having one of those spiritual awakenings of the educational variety. I had sort of slowly come to understand, like, that I have some sort of a purpose here on Earth. And that, like, I'm useful. And I'm not this horrible sack of shit that I always thought I was. And I don't know if any of you were capable of imagining this, but this was a radical way of thinking for me. Like, I really, like, when I first got to rehab, they put me with a pen and paper in a room, and they said, I want you to make a list of the positive qualities that make up you. And I cried. And that was all I did. I sat there with that pen and paper, and I fucking cried for like an hour, because I couldn't think of a goddamn single thing to put on that piece of paper. There was nothing about me that I thought was good. Not a single fucking thing. And you know, a year and a half out, that wasn't true anymore. I felt like I had a lot of qualities that were actually not just terrible and despicable. These days, I feel like I have a lot of positive qualities. I don't know. I, I still feel like I have a lot of negative qualities, too, to tell you the honest to goodness truth. But they're not as glaring as what they were before. I'm, I'm not a thief. I'm not a liar. I'm not the person you can't leave alone in your house because I'm probably going to set fire to it, steal all your shit, and run away. Because I've done that a few times, actually. I am not a horrible person. In fact, I'm a reliable, intelligent, hardworking, honest individual who wants to be happy and who wants other people to be happy, too. Like, it's something that the people who actually know me will probably tell you is that I'm a pretty good person and that they actually enjoy knowing me and that, like, having me in their lives is not an unpositive thing. Which just... <laughs> it's even said that way, this is radically different than... <laughs> like, like, young me, people didn't want to know. You didn't want me in your life. You brought me into your life. Shit was going to happen to you as a direct result of having brought me into my life that you didn't want happening. I positive that's true. I stole everything that all my friends had. I betrayed all of them in many ways. And I, I don't do any of those things anymore, you know? I uh, After that, I had finished working the 12 steps with this weird old bald guy. I, I decided I was going to find a new sponsor to whom I could, like, personally relate. Um... I met a guy who, uh, he was an old deadhead, and I had been to a lot of Grateful Dead concerts when I was young. It was something that I really enjoyed, and he and I, like, co-secretary this grapevine meeting at the Rockridge Fellowship, and I got to know him pretty well over the course of, like, six months, and he's the person I asked to be my sponsor. Here's a very weird thing, is he and I have little in common outside of the fact that we're both deadheads and alcoholics. He's like old and gay and really kind. And like, I didn't think I was any of those things. He, he's not like divorced with kids. He's just an older guy. And I got to know him and his husband like really, really well. And they taught me a lot about sobriety and a lot about things I had no idea about at all, like ways to live and just ways to be like a normal human being that could be lovable. Um, when his husband got sick, I got the privilege of bringing up meetings to their house every week with a close group of friends, and we watched him slowly wither away and die. Every week he got a little bit worse until finally... He passed away. And, you know, I, I mention this not because it's a horrible, sad thing, because it was a special spiritual experience, and there was a lot of growth for me around it about a lot of things. He was a wonderful human being, and I got to know him very well, and I'm happy to say that he was a part of my life. His name was Jeff, and he taught me a lot of shit about being sober and about being a good person. And 
you know, my sponsor hasn't really been the same since Jeff died. He's been going through stuff, understandably, but, you know, he and I have still been there for each other, and we've still been, you know, working steps and doing stuff, a lot of stuff, and we had a couple of anniversary meetings after his husband's death, like, where we all went back to his house and talked about, you know, what we'd been through, shared how we had grown around it. It was really, it was sort of meaningful and really beautiful and really something that, you know, eight years ago, me would not have been capable of being a part of. There was something really scary going on. And like older, drunker me wanted to run away and hide from that. And sober, compassionate me was like, these people are suffering and I'd like to be there for them and I'd like to do anything I can to help them and to like be part of their experience in this world in a positive way. And, you know, that that's what I did. And it, it was a really, really deep experience. And I, I loved Jeff and I'm really sad that he's dead. And I'm really super proud that I got to be a part of his life. And I'm super happy that I was able to be there for him when he really needed me. Yeah, so these days I do the four things that Megan was talking about. I go to meetings. I work the steps. I have service commitments. I have sponsees and a sponsor. And I do all of the stuff. I, I don't know, like, what among those four things is, like, the thing that's keeping me sober. And I frankly don't really give a fuck. What I know is that when I'm doing those four things, things are pretty fucking good. And life has been pretty great. And a lot of good things happen. And I'm super happy about that. I don't want to risk, like, the life that I have for, like, anything. And a couple parting things. The things that keep me sober today are remembering what it was like. I've heard it said many times, the further you get from your last drunk, the closer you get to your next one. Remembering what it was like is a big fucking deal. The pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization that was my life. I need to keep that like right here in front of me. I need to be able to see it sometimes to remind myself that drink doesn't really look so good. What it looks like is me wallowing in a puddle of my own fucking filth and unable to communicate with other human beings. That's what that drink looks like to me. The other thing is having a life that I don't actually want to ever give up. I have people in my life that I love. I have things in my life that I love doing. And I have, like, good stuff happening. I mean, I have this beautiful wife who's a really wonderful person. She's kind of awesome. And I've gotten to watch her get sober and become a radically different person than she was. And I've gotten to watch other people get sober and become radically different people than who they were. And at the same time, watching myself grow and watching my life expand and become better and better every day. And I fucking wouldn't give that up for anything. I keep that right in front of me all the time. I don't want to lose it. That's it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.